Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We're in the book of Acts right now. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 4. We're going to get into Acts 5 as well today. We will have some scripture on the screen as well in case you want to read it that way. How many know God knows the truth? And he is the truth. Amen. Now, depending on, you know, how you take that phrase, it can be a little intimidating too, right? God knows the truth is the title of our message today. I want to remind you that Luke is the author of Acts and he's writing to his friend Theophilus. And you can imagine that as you uh, gather reports from the apostles and the disciples, that there's a lot of things to write down. So Luke doesn't write everything down word for word. Instead, Luke gathers highlights of what happened in the beginning, the first three to five years of the church. And Acts 2, 42 through Acts 6, 7, so chapter 6, verse 7, Luke is covering about three to five years and he's highlighting the first, uh, some things that happened in the first church, all right? So he doesn't, if, if he were to record everything for Theophilus, he would have this massive book and that's just one and he would have a bunch of those, right? So he's just giving highlights of what's, what has taken place. And Acts 2, 42 through 47 talks about how they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to breaking of bread, to fellowship, um, to worship, to the word. Okay, they were, they were devoted to one another. They were sharing all these things. So what Luke does is he gives little examples of Acts 2, 42 through 47, all the way through Acts 6, uh, verse 7. All right, so today... We're getting an example of what he meant by that, okay? We're getting a little insight into the giving of the church, okay? Their generosity to one another. And we're gonna see here two examples. One is a positive example of generosity and one is a negative example of this generosity, all right? And you might be wondering, how is that possible? Well, because it depends on your heart and your generosity, all right? Now, I do realize that it might be a little quiet here today because this scripture is serious, okay? It doesn't mean that you need to be quiet. If you agree with something, we learned last week, you're allowed to say amen, okay? If it stings, you know, it's like, oof, you know, that's okay. That's okay. That's the word of God. The word of God is, is there to correct. It's there to rebuke, correct, uh, to teach, and to train in righteousness, Okay? And we need to allow the word of God to do his work, okay? Because his, his word is alive and active, all right? Okay, Acts 4, verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them. What a, what a church, because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles or to the apostles' feet in some translations to give those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the land of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Wow, powerful. What a church that they were in so much unity spiritually that they showed it physically. That they were one church in Jesus Christ and to the point where people were helping everyone in need. The church was not needy. Everyone's needs were taken care of. That's an attractive church, isn't it? That would draw the world in. In fact, the first church impacted Rome so much that it became Christian centuries later. And it was through the generosity and the benevolence of the church that actually impacted Rome as well. All right, so this was a powerful church and they expressed it by giving and helping each other. And, and the, the apostles were successful in preaching the gospel and God was blessing them. All right, so things were going really well. And then the example, the positive example is Barnabas. He sold a piece of property and he gave it to the apostles to do what they needed to do to take care of the needs of the church. 
And that's very similar to what we do here at church. When you give to the church, we have to allocate those funds where it's needed, depending on the needs, as well as including electricity, right? How many would like to be in a sermon in the dark? Be a little different, all right? So here's your positive example, but then there's a negative example. And this is the part where maybe you're scratching your head a little bit on your theology of God and your view of God. Maybe you've never seen God in this light in the New Testament. Well, this is a real, this is an eye opener. All right, so buckle in. So Acts chapter five, verse one, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. Everything's good so far, right? He brought part of the money to the apostles, ooh, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. So in other words, they were conspiring together on this. Then Peter said, and now here's an example of a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Okay, take from this portion of scripture, the Holy Spirit active in the church, helping the church. Okay, and Peter has a word of knowledge from God. And this is what he says, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. Wow. They could have easily sold the property and agreed to only give half, only give three-fourths. But instead, they wanted to give the full amount, claiming it was the full amount, but actually they kept some for themselves. And we learn right here in this scripture too, that when you give to God's work, when you give to your church, you're actually giving to God first. Because God sees that and, and Peter says, you have lied to God. He didn't say you lied to me, you lied to God. You're trying to rob God. And the sad part about this is, is that Ananias got his wife to join him. So now this is premeditated sin, deciding to do this beforehand, getting his wife to join him in this. And together they come to the apostles thinking that the apostles wouldn't know, but the Holy Spirit is at work in his church revealing truths because God knows the heart of man and God knows the truth. Now, it's important to note that Ananias did not sentence him to death. If you look at this again, you'll see that he's just declaring his lies and then he dies. The apostles didn't have the power to take someone's life, okay? This was God. God saw fit to stop his heart from beating and he died. He fell to the ground. And that wasn't Peter. Peter was just saying, hey, you, you've lied to God. Next thing you know it, he falls to the ground. And guess what spread throughout the church? Fear. But a healthy fear. A holy fear. And probably a little bit of fear, right? The word here in the Greek is actually phobos, where we get our word phobia. Okay? So there is a little bit of fear there. But there was also this reverent fear growing because of this. A holy fear. In other words, let me respect God. Let me, let me obey him and listen to him and do what he says. Now, you would think the wife would find out. She didn't. And about three hours later, let's pick up in verse seven. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Here is her chance to be honest. Here you get one chance and here it is. Is this the price you and your husband receive for your land? <sighs> yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? Now again, he's not sentencing her to death. He already knows what happened to Ananias. He figures this is what's gonna happen next, all right? 
And this is what he says next. The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Wow, what an intense story, right? Now, when I've talked to people, they've, they've asked me, how could God be so severe? Why, why such a severe consequence? Why such a severe punishment? And I would actually turn that question back and say, why is God on trial? Why is God being questioned? Why is God being scrutinized? Isn't God a fair, just, and righteous God? Doesn't he know the heart of man? Doesn't he know what could happen next if he allows this stuff to take place? Maybe we should put sin and sinners back on the stand. Why is it that we can be so prideful as human beings that we think we can question the God of the universe instead of taking responsibility for our sinful ways? And you're seeing that in our world today, aren't you? You're seeing that when someone messes up or sins, it's everyone else's fault. It's not their fault. Listen to me. This was not, this was not unjust. This was just. God knew what he was doing and we just need to trust God. God knew, I'll try to give you some explanations, but there isn't no easy explanation for this. We just have to trust God. One explanation is this, that it was the beginning of the church's growth and God always dealt severely with the beginnings of things. Let me give you an example. And uh, in, in the Old Testament, if we recall, and I'm, well, I'm, I really went ahead without even looking, using my notes. Praise God. Let me catch up. All right. If you recall also with the priests and the sons, where am I? There we are, okay. What about Aaron's sons who authorized, who did unauthorized fire in their worship practice? That's Leviticus 10, one through two. What about when Achan kept some plunder when God strictly said, do not take anything from your victory today and Achan took some and hid it underneath his tent. How many know you can't hide things from God? Well, they lost a war because of that. They lost a little battle and God had to deal with that sin before they could move forward. And sure enough, the Holy Spirit revealed that Achan had sin and he admitted it and he, he and his family paid dearly for it. God cleansed the church. God cleansed the people of God in that moment so they could move forward. What about David? when he first attempted to bring back the ark of Jerusalem or to Jerusalem, but Uzzah touched it and died. Kind of severe when you read it. It's like, man, just a little bit of mercy and grace there. But he, they were told how to carry the ark and he didn't listen. They did not follow God's guidelines the way they were supposed to. And God is calling upon the people of that time to trust him to obey him, to listen to his instructions. And they were trying not to. It's interesting too, that they were trying to test the Holy Spirit in our story as well. I think we need to understand that. They weren't just lying. Peter said they were testing God. Now I wanna go back to that and read to you the, uh, the definition or the meaning of what it means to test the Holy Spirit. It's to see how much one can get away with before he judges. How much can I get away with? How close can I get to the line before God judges me? Before consequences come forth? It means to see if he will perform his word. Will God punish those who are doing those things? Or stretching God's limits of judgment to see how much we can go and do before he judges us. Unfortunately, by the way, a lot of our sin brings enough consequence on ourselves, doesn't it? A lot of our sin brings so much consequence on ourselves that God's not even necessarily having to punish us or judge us because our sins have brought so many, so many consequences in our lives. You know what I'm saying too, right? So this is what they were doing. They were testing the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> all right? There is no easy explanation for this. The only thing other that we have is this. At the beginning of the church, because it says here that Peter said, you let Satan fill your heart. Wow, that's scary. 
Think about that. They weren't just tempted by sin or tempted by the devil, but they let the devil fill their hearts to guide them. And so God is seeing the devil infiltrate his church. And God says, I got to cleanse it. And that's what he did. And, you know, when I look at that and you, I actually go, God's very merciful, isn't he? And let me explain. It's really easy. Think about all the things we've done wrong since the day we were born and we're still here. He's a merciful God, isn't he? Wow, he puts up with us. He has been so good. We, yeah. I mean, we just saying he's been so good to me. Oh, he has. <laughs> he has, because he knows. He knows the heart of every person in this place. God's a merciful God. In this moment of history, of church history, God saw to it that he needed to deal with this severely. And you know what? We need to accept that and move forward. Simple as that. So number one, if we were to apply this to our lives, I think we can learn a lot of lessons like sin is deadly and destructive, right? Don't test the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of good lessons here, but let me just try to wrap it up with three main things. One, God is concerned for the purity of the church. God cares about the holiness and the purity of the church of the church, as you can see right here. The church, this is from J.B. Polhill commentary. The church, when it is the church, is a holy community, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that we're a temple of the Holy Spirit? That we house the Holy Spirit, so we are sacred and we are holy in God's eyes? Not just corporately, but I mean individually. Disunity, duplicity, and hypocrisy always belie the Spirit and hinder his work. If the church is to have a genuine spiritual power in its life and witness, it must be an environment of the spirit devoted to maintaining its sanctity and purity. The primary interest, not, not the only interest, but according to the Full Life Bible Commentary, the primary interest for Luke in recounting this story is not to strike fear in the human heart, although it did but to teach that the Holy Spirit is active in the church. God assures the church that they will enjoy and benefit from the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit protects the church's integrity and guards against such divisive sin as that of Ananias and Sapphira. So in other words, we, we want to feel the joy of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit also has to do some convicting and some judging some work, some cleansing. Why? For the well-being of the church. So the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit will make you feel wrong about things so that you won't test him anymore. So that you'll turn away. You won't test the limits of how far you can go. And it feels ugh inside. It does. Okay. I'm not perfect. So I know what it feels like for the Holy Spirit to work on me and correct me. All right. And it feels gross, but I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit convicts me with a burden to change. <clears throat> and I feel bad for what I've done. Why? To keep me soft and responsive and sensitive to the Holy Spirit to continue to help me be pure. So the church also has the Holy Spirit working through his people. And this moment, the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter to reveal the truth. And then obviously we see the consequences therein. So secondly, what do we need to do? We need to guard our hearts. I would encourage you, I encourage myself, guard your heart. The devil knows how susceptible your heart is. It's wicked. It's deceitful. And we are hopeless without the grace of Jesus Christ coming into our hearts and changing us. And the only reason why you have changed is because of God's grace and his spirit dwelling in you. And we need to continue to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. The devil knows that. Come on, we know that. We are susceptible. We need to guard our hearts 
I love what James chapter four says. Verse seven, humble yourselves before God or submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, God, I can't do this. I'm struggling with this temptation. I can tell the devil is trying to work on me right now. And Lord, instead of submitting to that desire, I submit to you. Lord, help me. Help me. When you do that, you're already fleeing from the devil's temptations and schemes when you submit to the Lord. But it's also making a decision. I'm done. I'm, get out of here. I'm not going to even entertain that. And you run from the devil's temptations. Okay, now it goes on to say, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there, ready for this, the Bible says, let there be tears for your sin. Grief and mourning. Oh, that doesn't sound very, you know, that doesn't sound very encouraging. Well, you know what the other option is? Be prideful of your sin and never feel bad about it. I like the other option of crying about it, you know. I, in other words, stay sensitive and broken for your sin. If not, Satan's influencing you and your hearts will be full of sin and his influence. I knew it would be a little quieter in here. It was quiet this week for me as I was reading this. Oh, okay, God. It says this, let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. But this next verse is so encouraging. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Amen. He will lift you out of that. His mercy is good. His mercy is there to lift you out. The reality is Sapphira had a chance. Humble yourself and say, you know what? We lied to you. I'm sorry. That wasn't the full amount. We kept the portion of it. And that was wrong of us. She could have done that. But it was too late. Her heart was full of sin and Satan influencing her. We don't want to get to that place. Amen. Amen. Guard your heart. And there's two reasons or two, two reasons that seem to motivate Ananias and Sapphira. So let me give you uh, a couple traps of the devil. And to be honest with you, it's our flesh that wages war in us too, okay? The first one is the love of praise. I truly believe, although it doesn't say it literally in scripture, I did find two other theologians who said the same thing after I personally interpreted this, but it appears that Ananias and Sapphira were wanting praise from man. They saw what Barnabas did and they said, let's do that too. In other words, to get some accolades, to get an attaboy for giving a gift. Why does that make sense to me? It makes sense because they also want a little bit of money. So it proves that it was about selfish gain. Selfish gain. So they were thinking about themselves instead of the need of the body of Christ. And so they wanted to keep a portion, but still get the credit like Barnabas got. And so they loved praise of man rather than being honest with God. Friends, just think about this for a second. What's better, to get praise from man or praise from God? And God's word says, so generously, reap generously. God was gonna bless them and take care of them in, anyway. He already was, and he was gonna do it again. And, and why, why strive after man's praise? What good is it? Yeah. We're all finite. We all die from dust to dust. What good is it for man's praise? And e even so, the Old Testament says, don't let your own lips praise you. Let the lips of others praise you. You know? But they, they wanted that for themselves. They didn't want to give glory to God. They didn't want to show people, you know, God is good and his blessing. They wanted the glory for themselves. They wanted to, to receive what Barnabas received. I truly believe that. We can't see it exactly in scripture for sure. But you know what? I think about that on a human, human level. That's a temptation that we would all deal with, wouldn't it be? What about this? Secondly, the love of money. Wasn't Judas trapped by the love of money? Wasn't the rich young man or the rich young ruler just trapped by the love of money? 
And we know it's not, money is not the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's when you love money. And, and Jesus said, you can't serve both God and mammon or God and material things or God and money. You can't serve both. You'll give your heart to something more if they're competing together. You're gonna choose which one, right? I choose God, but the temptation is, is to serve everything else. And they chose to serve their wallets or serve their bank accounts at that time. They didn't have a bank. There was no M&T bank back then. Okay. I don't know what it was. Camel and pyramids. I don't know. That was their bank. That doesn't make sense. Okay, never mind. They didn't have bank accounts back then like that. Okay. They chose to serve that. It was the love of money that the devil used. And we are weak too. And we'll put our trust in something like that when it's just paper and numbers. And so be careful. Why do I bring this up? Guard yourself from at least those two things, but there's many more things that the devil is trying to tempt you with. You follow me on that? Amen. If you ever wondered who we truly give to, when you give to the church, you're really giving to God and his work. You're really given to him. So God sees your heart when you give. God sees your heart if it's a cheerful heart when you give. He sees why you're giving. I just wanna tell you, I've never had anyone, this would be really weird by the way. <laughs> I've never had anyone go, hey Ryan, I set my, my giving in, uh, check out how much I gave. Thank you for not being like that. <laughs> that would be weird. And I would say, take it back. We don't want that. Because that is not giving to the Lord. That's trying to get something for yourself. We don't want that. We don't want money like that. And when we as, as the church and the board, when we look at the finances and the church leadership look at the finances, we do allocate those funds to take care of this church to help people in the church, to help us have electricity, to help us function, to reach the lost, to be missional around the world. We're blessing missionaries all the time. Thank you so much for giving unto the Lord. Remember when we were just saying, it's not about religion and his way is better? Don't even let your giving be religious. I said this a couple weeks ago, because we don't take collection the way we used to by passing the things around. Even our giving can be religious because we just, it's always coming out. Make sure you pray over that giving. We need you to pray over your giving. I need you to pray over your giving that God would multiply and use it for his glory. And that's key. Wisdom and guidance that we would put that where it needs to be, amen? And we thank you for entrusting you know, your, your finances to God's work here. I give to our church. I tithe, I have to tithe as well to the district as a pastor of the Sons of God, but I tithe and I give to the church. I trust this church and the leadership that has been appointed here, especially our board. And so it's a going in good hands. But I think this is a great lesson to understand. You're giving to God first and foremost before you ever give to the church and the leadership here. Amen. 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 So therefore, my last point is give and live for the glory of God. Give is simple. Give for the glory of God. When you give, just know that it's for the glory of God. Okay, we wanna, we wanna use it for the glory of God. Live for the glory of God. Make him famous. Don't try to be famous. Don't try to be famous. Okay, let's give praise to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. He's a, he's a Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He's providing for us. Let's give him the glory for what we do and what we give and how we live. He deserves the glory. Amen? Amen. In closing, this judgment or cleansing of the church actually accomplished a lot. As severe and serious as this divine judgment was, it actually helped the church thrive. 
This discipline encouraged honesty. Honesty went up 200%. (laughs) Lying went down 200%. (laughs) Discipline is supposed to actually help you grow, not hinder your growth. Church discipline is, is because God loves his church. God loves you. He disciplines those he loves. All right? When the church operates in discipline, it's to protect the integrity of the church so that it can continue to thrive. So that honesty thrives, not lying, not deception, not conspiracy or conspiring together. All right? That's why that happens. It encouraged holiness. It encouraged respect for the spirit of God. It encouraged generosity with pure motives. Did it happen again? Well, we don't have any record of it happening. I think I know why. I think I know why. It didn't happen again. It struck a holy reverence and respect for God to obey him and to do what he says and to do it for his glory, not their glory. And look what the scripture says next because I wanna read to you this and Pastor Jody is gonna preach next week to help out. He, he asked for um, uh, Acts 5. Oh, I'm in James 5. Let me go back. He asked to help out with Acts 5. I said, yes, sir. Come on in. Did it hurt the church or did it help the church? It helped the church. Acts 5, verse 12, the apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them. So talking about the, possibly the priests there and the teachers of uh, the Jew, the Jewish teachers and priests. No one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. It could be really just people who, who had high regard for the apostles and the people of God, um, but they were nervous because the persecution going on against the church, all right? So they didn't dare to join them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women were coming to the Lord. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by in hopes that they would be healed as well. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Praise the Lord. That's an awesome church. You see, God was working powerfully and he wasn't going to allow Satan to infiltrate the church. He wasn't going to allow Satan and sin stop the church from growing and expanding and reaching the world. So listen, church, we have to understand that God deals with people because he loves us. Okay? That's in the book of Hebrews. I don't have the time to go into that today, but he disciplines those he loves. We're an illegitimate child if he doesn't discipline us. In other words, we're not truly saved if he doesn't discipline and teach us and train us and correct us. So if he is disciplining you, it's because you belong to the family of God. If he's correcting you, convicting you and teaching you and training you, it's because you belong to the family of God. His spirit is is, is working in your life. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to protect the unity, to protect the purity and the sanctity of the church. He will deal with sin and his Holy Spirit is, a, is alive and well to protect the, the church. Why? So that we can continue to thrive so that we can continue to spread and be powerful witnesses in our community while we stand together as we pray. I actually wrote this question down in the bottom of my outline. How should we pray then after receiving this message? <laughs> How should we pray? There's a lot of places we are in our lives. There's, your walk is different than the person next to you. Only God knows your heart and God knows the truth. I do want to put this out there to you who, who may not understand the gospel. The reason why the gospel is the good news is because we're doomed 
We're going to hell. We're going to experience eternal death if someone doesn't step in and save us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is Jesus. So we're all going to be judged, just so you know. The difference is those who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior will be pardoned. And you are now, as a believer, you are forgiven. Because Jesus has saved you from your sins. What Jesus did on the cross is enough for you. And he's drawing you to God tonight, today. He is, his spirit of God is drawing you to believe, to trust in him for salvation. Not your good works, not your faithful church attendance and any kind of religious action that you could do. That doesn't save mankind. It's trust in the works of Christ. He lived a perfect life died on the cross, even though he was not a sinner. He took on all of our sins. He defeated sin on that cross. And then he didn't even stop there. He defeated death when he rose again to give us eternal life. That is the promise for every person who believes in Jesus Christ today. If that's you, we want to encourage you to respond to the Holy Spirit's drawing today to give your life to Christ. Because on the day of judgment, you will be saved. You will be spared. And you will have everlasting life. So if we could, let's close our eyes. Let's begin to pray. Let's ask God, is that me, Lord? Is that me? We're gonna have the, our prayer team down here ready to pray. If you need to take a step towards Jesus today, we're ready to come, to come around you and pray with you. We also want to help you understand that decision. It's not a, a quick decision sometimes in our lives. We want to help process that with you. So I'm going to have our prayer team come on down. All right, and just prepare to receive anyone. How many want people to give their life to Christ today? Amen. Don't be afraid. If you need to give your life to Jesus, we're ready to pray with you. If you need prayer for anything else, we're ready to pray with you as well. As the church which is the majority of us here as believers, this scripture prompts us to purify ourselves, doesn't it? I think of, I ask that question, how do we pray? I think of David's words. Search me and know me. See if there's any offensive or wicked way in me. I think that's an appropriate prayer, amen? Lord, would you forgive us today, God, and Lord, reveal anything, Lord, that's going on in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we come to you knowing that we actually need your help to see some of these things. We can be so comfortable in our lifestyles, we don't realize we're living in sin. We can do things so much that it becomes part of who we are, but it's not part of who you are. Lord, would your Holy Spirit come in today and reveal things that need to change in our hearts and our minds? Things that we need to confess and repent of, to say sorry about and to turn away from and to turn to you at the same time. And Lord, we see in your word that if we humble ourselves, you are there to lift us up. Thank you for that promise. Lord, give us pure hearts. Purify your church, not just this one, but your church across this nation. Lord, help us to remain faithful to you or those who have run from you or run from your word. I pray, God, they would come running back to you. Thank you, Lord, that you're that father in the parable with arms wide open waiting for the prodigal to come home. And thank you, God, that you're also like that shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. You've put up with so much. We don't even deserve your love, but you showered us in your grace and love. Lord, let that grace not be a license to test you. Let that grace be the power that helps us live for you. 
to live a holy and pure life. I thank you for your presence in this place today. I thank you for a church that wants your word and cares about the truth. I thank you for a church, Lord, that's giving to you, Lord, with pure hearts and just continue to refine that, Lord. Refine us in every way, Lord, not just in our giving, but our worship, our serving. Lord, we will make room for you this week. We will remove things out of our hearts and our lives so that you reign in us again. Thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you're gonna do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.